to Naja Tori Unlimited, where we they get to the information and news as they happen as they hold. Eh, we go hear live narration of how these headsmen them. They I mean the wicked ones them. It be like say this thing we would live with any any so no be small matter issues don't land bracket. We gonna watch video. We gonna use na any any hear live narration of how this. Me kuna use na nyan see how this full any headsmen they walk how do they run their things. Me kuna watch and me kuna not forget to subscribe to the channel. This kind of information no good for ear. Me kuna they pray for the country things don't yakata. Stay tuned. The driver felt the wagon's tires rap rupture and decided to park the car with the hope of changing the tires. It was like a film in a GC motley crowd of armed men in military uniform came out of the bush they fired at the boot of the car ahead of us five of them came out of the bush another two came from the rear my daughter screamed mommy daddy what's going on there was no time to say a word they marched us through into the bush firing into the sky they hit me on my chest hit my daughter on her head blood oozed at this time it was better to kill me i shouted at one of the armed men his response was hell he went straight for my private part tore my dress with his gun the others ripped my dresses i was left with my undies my husband and my daughter started crying two of them dug their teeth into my breasts while attending a secondary school in Adamawa, I had lived with some Fulani, so I understood a few Fulani words. I started pleading, at least for my daughter. To my shock, at gunpoint, they removed the dress of my little girl. <laughs> One of them carried her on his head as a baby, on his head as my baby struggled, shouting, Daddy, Mommy, what's going on? Help me! <laughs> I could not help myself. We marched for nine hours. I was half naked. My daughter was totally naked. Her tears was like a, blood, a stream of blood on her cheeks. Our phones had been seized. We ended up in an ungoverned region in the thick of the forest. We met a well-organized group. There were some kidnapped victims. I saw two women, two ladies and three men. They were, there were some people with their legs chained to, to trees. They were as if half dead. We were separated. I was separated from my husband. My daughter was taken away. I only heard her screaming intermittently. I did not know what they were doing to her. These men, now about two dozen had a full kitchen. They had a huge camp and a traditional medical team. How can they say they don't know where these people are? How can they say that? But the camps appeared isolated from each other. We had noises afar indicating it might be nuclear settlements of camps. Right in my presence, I saw them pack the remains of a woman. They took her and buried her a few meters away from us. She had tribal marks. I cannot describe the agony of, of six days in captivity in this little piece. I cannot talk about how they asked my husband to choose between being, myself being raped or his daughter being raped. My husband broke down in uncontrollable tears. One of them hit him saying, you're a bastard. You they cry, idiot. They now give him an op they gave him an option that he should be raped by one homosexual among them. My husband a devout Muslim. My husband is a devout Muslim. He told them that homosexual and rape homosexual and rape of any kind was against Islam. They hit him with the bottle of AK forty seven. What do you know about Islam? You can imagine, you are being asked to choose between being raped by a homosexual, your daughter just nine years old, or your wife being raped. They gave the fourth option. 
If you fail to choose one, we will rape your daughter, rape you the man, and rape me, the wife. I myself, the sacrificial, I made myself the sacrificial lamb. My husband begged, <laughs> saying they should name any price. One of them asked him to bend down. Three beastly criminals sat on his back, jumping until he was too weak. <laughs> I was not allowed to put on any additional clothes. Imagine they, they rape you all night and they stop you from putting on any clothes for 24 hours. The rain fell, the rain fell once. I became a relic at a sexual museum for the unmet who in turn addressed me and asked questions about my financial standing. New Fulani men joined the camp. They organized military training for the new Fulani men that came teaching them how to shoot and walk through circles of glowing fire. They were not released until after six days. We were not released until after six days. We had to walk the same zigzag journey back to the main road. Our eyes blindfolded. During the negotiation to pay, they said the money was not for them alone, that they had to settle those who sent them. For me, I was... I see a thriving organized crime supported by powerful political interests. Now, I do not think we were released to freedom after paying a whopping 8 million naira. I do not think we can ever be free. We can never be free from the anguish, the psychological trauma, the nightmares we suffered, the occasional fits of my daughter, her waking up at night behaving strangely, her asking the same question over and over, Mommy! Mommy, why? Why? And I do not have an answer. In my life, I have never passed through a torture chamber like this. I do not think any society should let this happen. I do not know the fate of those we met and about seven other people brought during the six days we were in captivity. What I saw was a nation that has, colla that has collapsed but pretends she, is, she lives, a people on life support. Crime is not restricted to Fulani people alone. We have Yoruba criminals, but I don't think Yoruba criminals are this beastly. These elements are savages. I can't imagine, I can't imagine Yoruba thieves going to Sokoto or Meduguri to kidnap Fulani people and keep them in their own bushes. It gives me mental torture that this is happening and some people are even trying to justify or look for excuses. Well, as a devout Muslim, myself and my family have taken so less in Allah. <laughs> Not the Nigerian police, not the army, not the government. We have taken our faith the way it, make, it came, that our, this is supposed to be faith. I thank God that we successfully returned to where we live thousands of miles from Nigeria. We thank God that we have made a vow. Never shall me, any of my children or husband in our lifetime visit Nigeria again. Our remains, any time we die, will also not be buried in Nigeria. It was a suggestion my daughter made, which we all adopted. I pity the country. I pity her people who continuously walk like the living dead. I pity those who parade themselves as leaders because they know nothing about what is going on and, and, and the abyss the country is sunk already. I pity Yoruba people. Oh, I pity you. I pity my people. For me, the issue is not about President Buhari. Democracy can produce anything, even the worst in the society. What I worry about is the conspiracy of silence by the people themselves. The ignorance, the treachery, and the illusion 
that one day things would get better through another election. Since I was born in Nigeria, each year had led from bad to worse and on and on. I do not have a solution to what is going on, but I think very soon hell will let loose upon the earth as long as there is no law and order and anarchy and the rule of brutes in the order of the day. Once again, there can never be anything more comforting than my husband, who saw what I went through, but was able to exchange me, to encourage me, and even encourage me to write this little piece after months of agony and sociological imbalance. Good night, Nigerians.